Good afternoon or evening if you're watching from the East Coast. It's Saturday, May 1st here at SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We are currently awaiting Crew Dragon's departure from the International Space Station and make its way back to planet Earth. On screen is a view from Johnson Space Center uh, just right outside of Houston. Uh, we expect Dragon Resilience to push away from the space station at approximately 5.35 p.m. Pacific time with our Crew-1 astronauts, NASA uh, Crew-1 astronauts, Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi. Uh, right on screen is a view of Dragon. It is nighttime at the International Space Station, so you can get, I guess, uh, half uh, of the Dragon right there. If you joined us earlier, you know that the crew is suited and the Dragon and station hatches are sealed in preparation for departure. Uh, my name is Andy Tran, and I'm a production supervisor here at SpaceX. I am super excited to bring you live coverage of Crew Dragon completing its second trip to space with people on board as part of NASA's first official long-duration mission for our commercial crew program. Joining me today is NASA Public Affairs Officer Leah Cheshire. Thanks, Andy. It's awesome to be here, and we have got quite a night ahead of us. So once Dragon departs station, the crew's flight home is expected to last roughly six and a half hours. Upon departure, Dragon will use its Draco engines to thrust away from the station in a series of carefully choreographed maneuvers, or four departure burns, to increase the distance between the spacecraft and the space station. After that comes deorbit, entry, and landing, which covers all operations after the final departure maneuver. That includes trunk separation, a deorbit burn, closure of the nose cone, deployment of the drogue, and then main parachutes, and finally splash down off the Florida coast, at which point our teams will recover Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Soichi. Dragon is targeted to splash down off the coast of Panama City, Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico at 11.57 p.m. Pacific time, um, followed by the crew getting picked up at sea by one of SpaceX's recovery vessels. Today on board the space station is the Expedition 65 crew, led by JAXA astronaut and Crew 2 crew member Aki Hoshide, who just arrived to station a week ago and took over as station commander from NASA's Shannon Walker. As a reminder, just like during its approach to the International Space Station, Dragon's departure and deorbit is designed to be fully autonomous, requiring no action from the crew on board. NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough will be watching the undocking and departure from the cupola, but the prime departure monitoring role falls on Mike Hopkins and Victor Glover from Inside Dragon. Mission controllers in Houston and Hawthorne will back them up. Now let's go over to Brandy Dean at the Johnson Space Center to talk a bit about how the station crew have been preparing to send the crew home and what we can expect from here until Dragon departs Resilience the station. Brandy? SpaceX on the big loop for undocking briefing. Thanks, Leah. With 11 people on board the International Space Station, it has been a busy few days, although they got a few extra days with the delay in departure. Yeah, However, they have made the most of it. Over the last several days, the astronauts worked the to find Dragon full of cargo for the return undock, journey. Besides, it's for crew members, Dragon's going to be returning more than 260 kilograms or 570 pounds of cargo start time back to Earth. Zero, zero, About half of that is three, sample zero. from um, research projects on board the International Space Station, including multiple powered freezers packed with samples. All of this will get unloaded after we get the crew out following splashdown. From there, it'll be sent to researchers around the country for final analysis. The crews also removed emergency hardware that was kept inside Dragon and during dock operations and transferred back to the space uh, station. The and they took time to get their SpaceX suits the, unpacked. Uh, 0030 for the start of the sequence. Visors are closed and secured, and we are a go for the undock. We copy you are go, and your visors are down. Thank you. Station Houston on the Big Loop. Perform steps two through end in 1.602 Dragon Departure Monitoring.
Heron Commander Mike Hopkins there from the Dragon, letting the team on the ground know that they were ready for undock and had their visors down. That is part of the procedure of getting ready for their departure from the space station. Since getting the hatches closed, uh, Mike Hopkins and Victor Glover suited up and strapped in. We saw some of uh, Suichi Noguchi and uh, Shannon Walker's suit up in real time earlier this afternoon. And now all four astronauts are in their seats and standing by for undocking. We've got a final go, no go coming up in a few minutes where the joint SpaceX and NASA teams make their final call for Dragon to depart the station. That's one of many checkpoints in the return that will continue all the way up until just before the due to orbit burn, giving mission managers multiple chances to assess the weather at the splashdown zones and making sure everything is lining up before Dragon departs. So we'll stand by for that final go, no go, but for now everything's continuing to look good for an on-time departure. And with that, I'll throw it back over to Andy and Leah and Hawthorne. Thanks for the update, Brandy. And as you heard, we just got the confirmation that from Mission Control here in Hawthorne and Houston and the Dragon crew, uh, Crew Dragon Resilience is a go to undock. So now we're waiting for the undocking sequence to begin and that'll happen. It'll take about or less than five minutes for Dragon to separate from the International Space Station where it has called home for almost six months. The first step in the automated undocking sequence is for the umbilicals to retract. These umbilicals connect Dragon systems to the space station, transferring power, telemetry, and commands between the two vehicles throughout Dragon's stay. Now, once that is complete, Dragon will unlatch itself from the space station by releasing the 12 hard capture hooks in two separate phases. All that combined will take roughly four and a half minutes, and then Dragon will be ready to depart from the station, from the station and begin to push itself further and further away using its thrusters. Dragon's initial departure from station is a little different from any other docked vehicles like the Soyuz that rely on springs to push them away from the docking port. Dragon will execute two short thruster firings to undock using a combination of the 12 Draco engines around the base of the capsule, with the first breaking any stiction between Dragon and the docking port, and the second slowly backing the spacecraft away. We're expecting the call for the undocking sequence to begin at about 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. And once it's time for the four Crew-1 astronauts to do the orbit and splash down back on planet Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX and NASA. All of these sites are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Atlantic Ocean. Spreading uh, the supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission and future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. In the lead up to today, NASA and SpaceX jointly selected primary and alternate splashdown locations off the coast of Panama City, our primary location, and Tampa as the alternate. The selection process works with a lot of different variables, including the space station's orbital trajectory, what landing sites are available and have favorable weather, how much free flight capability Dragon has for the trip home, and the sleep schedule for the returning crew members. We'll start with calculating daily return options based off of the space station's current orbit and Dragon's capabilities to maneuver and line up for re-entry. The time from undock to landing at the primary site can vary from less than six hours to more than 39. Today, our primary landing site gets the crew home in about six and a half hours from undocking. Uh, certainly, getting home uh, the quickest comes with some obvious benefits, but we always have to make sure that the crew is properly rested for dynamic operations, preventing us from scheduling 20-plus hour days for them. Trajectory and ballistics experts provide the daily opportunities that would line up uh, Dragon with seven landing zones and split them into what we call ascending and descending opportunities. Dragon uses its Draco thrusters after leaving station to execute a series of altitude lowering maneuvers and to line up with the selected primary site. It can also change to different alternate sites while in free flight if sudden weather moves in that we want to avoid. And weather is something that we're constantly looking at, making the final call to proceed about two and a half hours before the crew undocks. For the crew one return, we'll be looking at a number of weather items. Some of the obvious ones are no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, both for the safety of the crew inside the capsule and the recovery teams on the water. We're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet a second or about 10 miles an hour and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Suichi back to Florida. 
Once Dragon is flying free, we'll have a number of additional checkpoints to either proceed towards the primary landing site, head to the alternate, or select a new zone based on real-time weather data. These checks are happening all the way up until we are in the final hours before the deorbit burn, which is the last burn in the trip home and commits the Dragon capsule to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And if you've been following along, the teams have been looking uh, at return opportunities since Wednesday, April 28th, with weather being the major factor. We waved off our initial opportunities to undock on the 28th and on the 30th, with teams making the decision to pursue our current undocking and splashdown plan just yesterday. The weather conditions in the Gulf for tonight's uh, attempt are ideal for splashdown and recovery, with very low wind speeds and almost glass-like sea states. This will be the first time uh, we're bringing crew back in a nighttime splashdown, but we are well prepa prepared. SpaceX was able to practice for this very scenario with the return of the CRS-21 cargo mission, returning a similar Dragon capsule with a nighttime splashdown off the Florida coast. All of our recovery teams have practiced for recovery conditions at night, giving us confidence to carry this out, uh, out this operation and bring the crew home safely. SpaceX also has additional personnel on the recovery ship to recover Dragon's parachutes and our standard set of medical professionals and Dragon technicians to secure the capsule and get the crew out quickly and safely. And another fun history fact for this return, this will be the first night splashdown of a U.S. crewed spacecraft since Apollo 8's pre-dawn return in the Pacific Ocean on December 27, 1968, with NASA astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Uh, it's quite a while since we've had a nighttime splashdown with crew members on it. But again, like Leah said, we've been practicing this uh, for years and have done extensive amounts of testing. If the mission teams were to wave off after undocking prior to the deorbit burn, the crew can remain on orbit for more than 60 hours before they have to come home. And after undocking, the trip home will take less than three days to either our prime or primary or alternate locations. So the crew have three days worth of food and snacks on board, along with plenty of water. And as Andy just mentioned, for today's undocking, Panama City is the prime splashdown location, and Tampa is the current, the backup location for splashdown. And as a reminder, Dragon does have the capability to change alternate locations after undocking from station if bad weather happens to move in. And we are awaiting for that uh, that call to begin undocking in about three minutes, well, two minutes from now. And as we mentioned, it should take a, under five minutes for that undocking sequence to actually occur. So we won't see any movement right away at first from Crew Dragon. Uh, if we're able to get a view of it, I know it's still there in a night pass uh, in their orbit around the Earth. So we'll be waiting and we won't see that initial movement, but we have to see those um, hooks and latches retract and then those two short burns. Yeah, we should be hearing the call out again in a couple minutes here, and that will begin the sequence to uh, start to pull away those hooks, and eventually Dragon will fire its thrusters to remove the stiction from its uh, forward bulkhead uh, and the station and begin to make its journey all the way back home to Earth. And if you've been listening, we got our go for undock from the team here, as you can see in Mission Control Houston, as well as the team here in Hawthorne. Uh, about 10 minutes ago, got that final go to undock, and Crew Dragon Resilience radioed back that they are go as well. Hatches. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say uh, we have some precious cargo on board with the four astronauts, but they're also bringing home quite a bit of uh, cargo, um, additional cargo as well, over 250 kilograms worth of supplies, uh, food and, and stuff uh, as well, and experiments to bring back um, with the return uh, to Earth. We heard them addressing in the previous show, we were uh, watching hatch closure. They addressed the polar lockers, and those help us bring home uh, science and research that's been conducted on station that needs to be refrigerated. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful capability of Crew Dragon that we're able to get that back to Earth to be analyzed. Um, and so that the teams here on Earth that put together those, those uh, investigations can take a look. And all that cargo is being stored in the pressurized section or, or sort of the capsule section of Dragon. Uh, sometimes we can store uh, objects in the trunk, but later on you'll see that we actually eject the trunk. SpaceX undock sequence commanded. We actually undock the trunk uh, in preparation for re-entry. copies, we see the same. That's the call we were looking for right on time at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Crew Dragon and the International Space Station flying 260 statute miles 
southwest of Liberia. You can see a picture of Crew Dragon there in the center of the screen. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, umbilical demate complete and nominal. It's copy. <laughs> And the first step has been complete, that umbilical demating uh, that provided power and data from International Space Station to Dragon. So now with Dragon getting ready to undock and the umbilicals have separated, let's go to Brandy in Mission Control at Johnson Space Center for updates. Thanks, Andy. That, uh, that uh, confirm confirmation of the umbilical retraction means that a ser series of steps have been set off. Um, right now, the first uh, set of six out of 12 hooks should be retracting. That starts just a split second after the undock command is sent. There are two sets of, of six for 12 in total. It'll take about four and a half minutes in all to unhook, after which time the uh, Dragon will be able to begin performing a series of undocking burns to move itself away from the space station. Again, that first set of six hooks should be retracting right now. Live view here of the Dragon from the cameras on board the International Space Station. When it does move away from the space station, you should be able to see that in real time. Again, waiting uh, as the 12 hooks that uh, are holding the Dragon to the space station begin to unhook. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. First set of hooks open and nominal. It's happening we see the same. Confirmation there from uh, the core in Hawthorne that the first set of hooks was able to unlatch as expected. Now working on that second set of six hooks. Those 12 hooks have been holding the Dragon to the space station. And once they've all retracted, the Dragon will begin to uh, perform a series of burns that will move it away. That's still about a minute or so away. First undocking burn should come at 7.34 p.m. Central Time. First burn is only a minute and a half, or second and a half long and will be quickly followed by a five second burn, undock burn two, at 7.35. And then almost immediately after that, a 16 second departure zero, uh, departure burn zero. Halfway through that second set of hooks. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, all hooks open and nominal. Dragon copies, we see separation. Mike Hopkins there confirming what you're seeing on the screen. Dragon moving away from the Mission International Spaces. Space Station. Dragon separation visually confirmed. And SpaceX concurs.
That and uh, docking taking place at 7.35 p.m. Central Time, 5.35 p.m. Pacific, while the station and Dragon were 260 miles above Mali. That wraps up Crew One's stay on the International Space Station, begun in November, and puts them on Dragon a path. SpaceX on the big loop, depart burn zero complete, nominal burn. Advanced copies, we see the same. And confirmation there of the first of several good burns taking place. Again, there are two undocking burns that uh, occur almost back to back, and those will be followed by departure burn zero. That's the first of four departure burns known as, uh, again, departure burn zero. It's a short firing of the Draco, of the uh, Dragon's Draco thrusters, lasting 16 seconds and increasing the Dragon's speed by just under half a mile. That gets Dragon flying away from the space station and sends it on a trajectory that will take it up and around the space station. Resilience department. Have a safe trip back home and the soft landings. Station farm resilience. Thanks for your hospitality. Sorry we stayed a little bit longer. We'll see you back on Earth. Be back in a couple of months. Space Station Commander Aki Hoshide, they're bidding crew one goodbye as they move away from the International Space Station. Again, that departure burn at zero was complete and nominal, so that sets uh, the uh, crew on their way home for the day. Again, we did have uh, undocking right on time at 7.35 p.m. Central Time, 5.35 p.m. Pacific. The station was flying 260 miles over Mali. We're going to be monitoring Crew Dragon throughout the departure sequence as it makes its way from the International Space Station. So wishing Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Suichi safe travels on their way home. But to take you through the rest of the departure se sequence, I'll be sending you back over to Leah and Andy and Hawthorne. Thanks. Thanks, Brandy, and great to see that successful undocking of Crew Dragon Resilience. You can still see it on your screen. The station is in an orbital nighttime. That's where this view is coming from. But very cool on the right-hand side, those two white dots. Station step four, ISS thrusters enabled. Houston copies. Those two white dots on the spacecraft, those are actually the windows. So uh, that is our crew of four inside, now beginning their journey back to Earth, having departed right on time. Dragon Ship Resilience is now on a trajectory to move up and over the station before additional maneuvers will change its orbital path to take it below and in front of the station. Dragon will autonomously accomplish that through three additional departure burns to get the uh, four astronauts of Crew-1 well away from the space station and on their way home. Yeah, it's quite interesting that um, Dragon decides to move up and over. The way I like to think about it is if you're on, if you've ever watched a track race, mm -hmm. when they start the track race, they stagger the folks and the, the, the person in the outer lane is sort of gets a head start, so to speak. But that's because the distance it takes to travel around the, the lap is much greater for the person further away from the center. And so with Dragon, what we do is uh, Dragon and International Space Station are, generally speaking, traveling at the same speed. And so if we just move it up to a higher orbit, it'll move relatively slower than the International Space Station, which would just clear it. And then once it's clear, it can start to uh, fire those thrusters again and make its way underneath the International Space Station uh, and be uh, clear of any uh, potential um, uh, sort of collisions. So uh, you may have noticed that uh, our average time for, to, to, from liftoff to the International Space Station is somewhere between 23 and 24 hours. But when we, when we leave, it's, it's a lot quicker. Uh, it's because we don't have any hold points during departure sequence, right? Uh, we can just kind of undock and start to head home with all of our burns. It takes a lot less time to leave than arrive. Uh, any second now, we are expecting the next departure burn, the second of four. Uh, this burn will increase the initial opening rate between Crew Dragon and the space station. 
And even though this is known as departure burn one, like you mentioned, is the second. We just completed depart burn zero, which was about 16 seconds. And this one should be about 21 seconds long. So we are standing by any moment now for that call. And we are continuing to see a view from the International Space Station. There goes the Draco engines firing. That is Dragon. And those two white lights, the solid white lights, again, are the windows. And I'm sure the crew is looking back at uh, the International Space Station as they continue to depart. And we just uh, got to note that Depart Burn 1 has started. As we mentioned, this is Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Depart Burn 1 is complete. Nominal burn, you are go to doff your suits per procedure for decimal zero one two. Cameras are already external. Reminder that ground will be deactivating the big loop following exit from the approach ellipsoid. And SpaceX uh, resuming its copies, good to part one burn. We have a go to doff the suits uh, for decimal zero one two and copy on the com. And it was over about as soon as it started, that depart burn one lasting about, about 21 seconds. Uh, and that came around five minutes after separation tonight. This burn will increase the initial opening rate between Crew Dragon and the space station. And we heard that the crew is now go to take off their space suits. So they don't have to wear their suits until it's time to really start the deorbit procedures. Uh, they can be in those comfort garments and, and be comfortable inside the vehicle. Uh, we really just want them to have those suits on and be in their seats for those first uh, major burns as we leave the International Space Station and then once again when we come back into Earth's atmosphere. Yep, continuing to uh, get good news all around with um, undocking, departure, and um, the second of four burns complete. Um, we're now waiting for Dragon to exit the keep-out sphere and the approach ellipsoid. The keep-out sphere is an imaginary sphere uh, 200 meters in diameter around the station. It's one of several safety zones set up to govern visiting spacecraft either arriving or departing the station. Uh, the station before moving into the keep out sphere, the spacecraft would have would have to be configured where they would not cross the imaginary boundary for at least four orbits, even if the spacecraft were to somehow lose control of its maneuvering. The approach ellipsoid, or AE, is another imaginary shape, this time a three-dimensional ellipsoid, measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers. It's in the same family as the keep-out sphere. One of the key differences with the AE is that vehicles outside of it have to be on what we call a 24-hour safe free drift trajectory. So similar, but this means that the spacecraft would not cross into the approach ellipsoid for at least 24 hours again. Station Houston on the big loop. Dragon has exited the keep-out sphere. Thanks. Crew Dragon now outside the keep out sphere, still inside that approach ellipsoid. And the next burn will be depart burn two. That comes up at 628 Pacific time. So a little, a uh, little less than 45 minutes from now. That's a 44 second burn. That keep out sphere, as we mentioned, one of several safety zones set up to govern visiting spacecraft, either arriving or departing the station. Whether those have crew members on them or not, we're always tracking what's in the vicinity or the neighborhood of our space station. So before moving in the keep out sphere, we had to uh, know that the spacecraft is configured to not cross that imaginary boundary for at least four orbits, even if it lost all control of its thrusters. And uh, that can be a hold point at some times on the way uphill or the way to station, but but as you've noticed uh, on the way home, it's not somewhere that we have to hold. We can simply uh, move right through it and continue the journey. And Dragon continuing to distance itself from the International Space Station. We'll hear a call here shortly that it has passed the approach ellipsoid, a bit bigger of an imaginary uh, shape around the International Space Station with um, an ellipsoid measuring four kilometers by two by two. This is another view of Dragon, uh, getting a little bit of light. Again, you can see the windows uh, right above the red and green lights. 
We are looking for that approach ellipsoid exit to come up around 5.54 p.m. Pacific time. So less than 10 minutes from now, it is significantly bigger than the uh, keep out sphere. But this is a cool picture of Dragon. You can see the capsule down toward the bottom of your screen and then the trunk near the top. Uh, and on the trunk on the white side, that's the radiator. It helps radiate heat. And I love this glow right now. The sun is uh, coming up on the space station and onto Crew Dragon. Oh, that is cool. SpaceX Resilience, comm check on the cabin mic. SpaceX on the big loop. I hear you loud and clear. Help me. We have you the same. Good comm check. The International Space Station uh, and Dragon are just over the Black Sea right now. Um, they're moving so fast that they'll see um, a sunrise or sunset uh, is every 90 minutes. 17,500 miles per hour is how fast they're moving. And these uh, movements that we see our, our camera moving, Dragon is moving itself, but not quite as uh, quickly as, as we see these movements happening right now. And uh, just a few weeks ago, they, this crew and this vehicle had a bit of practice. Uh, uh, on the first week of April, uh, the crew was uh, had donned their spacesuits, um, got entered the vehicle, and undocked and relocated themselves from one port to another. Um, so that while they didn't quite uh, exit the approach ellipsoid, they got pretty far out there where they had to uh, turn on their LIDAR and uh, redock with the International Space Station. Yeah, it was definitely a dress rehearsal. Uh, all four crew members got suited up, got in their seats, strapped in, um, just in case that the redock was did not occur. But uh, as we saw, everything worked well. And that was to move Crew Dragon from the forward-facing port on the Harmony module to the space-facing port, where it just undocked from. And that leaves that space vacant. Crew 2 docked to the forward Harmony port last week when they arrived aboard Crew Dragon Endeavor. And now that the Zenith-facing or space-facing port is empty, SpaceX Commercial Resupply Mission 22 can move in later this summer and bring along with it some uh, research for the crew, food, supplies, as well as the new solar arrays that we'll be looking to install. Yeah, it's going to be quite a busy year for the Dragon program. Um, it's been an exciting couple of weeks with uh, the relocation, Crew 2 heading on up there, now Crew 1 departing. And then, like Leah mentioned, we have a CRS mission in the summer, as well as two more crewed missions using the Dragon vehicle um, in uh, the fall uh, with um, Inspiration 4, as well as the Crew two mission, uh, Crew 3 mission, sorry. And before Crew Dragon came home today, there were a long list of activities that needed to be checked off. Earlier this week, it's a, it's a very interesting thing to see, and I believe that there was a photo shared of it. I'm not sure by who, but uh, the Canadarm2 was used to check out the exterior of the vehicle and uh, look at the heat shield for any micrometeroid or orbital debris. Obviously, they got a green light because they have departed. And we saw the crew suit up earlier, close their hatch. They also had to conduct some leak checks uh, with the crew members themselves in their spacesuits, and as well as with the vestibule or the space between the International Space Station hatch and the hatch on Crew Dragon. We want that to be down to a vacuum so that when the crew members depart, it's uh, it's an equal it's, it's equal to uh, the vacuum of space. Uh, so we just ha we're having a satellite handoff right now. We should get uh, visuals back uh, shortly here. But speaking of interesting photos, I was uh, browsing the astronauts' Twitter, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, Victor's Glo Victor Glover's birthday was yesterday, and it uh, seems like they had a great night. Uh, there was a saxophone, uh, there was balloons, cakes, and a keyboard involved, uh, but all the astronauts, uh, seems like uh, they are getting along uh, very well with each other um, up there in space. Yeah, it's, I, I love, you know, just seeing those real life pictures yeah. of what's happening on the International Space Station because we know that they devote so much time and, and, and you know, dedication to the science that's going on because that's really why, why they are there. It's an orbiting laboratory that, 
you know, does research that benefits not only our future space exploration goals, but also all of us here on Earth. And uh, so in their downtime, when they get to relax, you know, some of them do play instruments. I've seen videos of what looks like to be a little space band. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of the things we like to do here on Earth. They, they like to share meals together, watch movies. Yeah, they, um, it's, you know, watching them do the science experiments, it does, definitely looks like they're like kids in a candy store. They, they are absolutely ecstatic about um, sort of how the properties uh, of experiments will change in the microgravity environment. Again, we are waiting for the call out for Dragon to continue to um, uh, distance itself from the International Space Station and eventually exit the approach ellipsoid. It's an imaginary ellipsoid around the International Space Station uh, measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers. Um, we're looking for that to come up just a few minutes from now. Uh, it says 5.54 on Pacific time. Uh, so we'll be standing by for that. And this, like we mentioned earlier, with the keep out sphere, this is another place that you might stop on the way up and perform any checkouts before the vehicle gets closer to the space station. But on the way down, smooth sailing, uh, we are clear to go. So uh, we also heard the astronauts are now out of their suits. And I believe that was Mike Hopkins testing out the uh, cabin microphone, which means it's not the microphone that is built into their suits. It's it's one that they're able to use and float around the capsule with. Uh, so that means they're out of their seats as well. I can only imagine they might be getting some views out the window of their home for the previous six months on the International Space yeah. Station. It's going to be a very exciting couple of hours here coming up with um, the crew returning. Uh, I should mention that throughout tonight's broadcast, uh, if you have any questions, we are taking questions. Uh, if you use the hashtag Launch America, we'll try to answer them here on air. Uh, we have one right here. Will the will we be able to see the capsule re-enter the atmosphere from the ground here in Florida since it will be dark? Uh, I think so. Uh, we were talking uh, earlier with the uh, commercial crew program manager, and there's not a ton of clouds. If you are near Panama City or probably somewhere in Florida, you should be able to see a reentry of uh, the Dragon, depending on the cloud coverage. When the capsule re-enters the atmosphere, it'll largely be over the water, so uh, maybe a little out of sight for most people on land to see. Um, but we did hear that there will be a lot of moonlight, so hopefully we get some good views. The best views that you'll get will be on this broadcast, we promise you that. Yeah. Um, but it, it won't be the same as seeing those those uh, four main parachutes billowing as the capsule comes down. Uh, so we are targeting uh, Splashdown just before midnight Pacific time. So if you are on the uh, East Coast, uh, you might have to stay up uh, a little bit uh, in order to see the Splashdown. Now this view on the right hand side of your screen, that's Mission Control Houston, the International Space Station Flight Control Center uh, at Johnson Space Center. And so we are still in integrated operations. Now the uh, spacecraft Crew Dragon is still in the neighborhood of the International Space Station. So these teams work together in tandem to make sure uh, all systems on both vehicles are set to what they need to be to make sure these um, procedures move smoothly as we've seen everything going well so far and we're looking at just a minute or two until they exit the approach ellipsoid and it really has been a joint effort from not just spacex and and nasa but the faa the the coast guard in order to make sure that the crew uh, undocks safely returns home safely so um it cannot be stressed enough that it really is a team effort to make sure that everyone is doing their part and all uh, these astronauts um, are coming home safely. As we mentioned earlier, this is NASA's first splashdown since 1968 with the Apollo 8 crew, which is one of my favorite missions. Um, and this splashdown tonight also breaks a record. Not only has it been that long since we did a nighttime splashdown, but the capsule itself is now going to be the longest duration mission of an American crewed capsule in space. Um, they're beating out the Skylab record from the final Skylab mission. That was 84 days, one hour and 15 minutes. And so we're coming home with 168 days here. Um, I think they I think they passed it. Yeah. Um, if you exclude demo two, uh, Splashdowns uh, don't happen too often nowadays, right? Most of the vehicles will land on land. Uh, the space shuttle landed itself. Um, so 
you know, while this may seem new and we haven't done this for decades, uh, we have rehearsed this many times and the Dragon One program splashed down every one of its vehicles and we were able to recover most of it. Um, so, you know, we're, we are definitely expecting a safe return for all of our astronauts on board the capsule resilience today. And we should hear that call to exit the approach ellipsoid any minute now at four, four kilometer by two kilometer by two kilometer. Invisible shape, invisible uh, ellipse, we should say. The imaginary sphere, <laughs> Yes, right? yes. Uh, it just helps us monitor vehicles as they arrive and they depart. So Crew Dragon undocked. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Dragon has exited the approach ellipsoid and is on a safe free drift trajectory. Houston will be taking down the big loop shortly and expect ISS audio traffic to cease. Please swap your audio destination to Dragon to Ground at your convenience and contact me for a comm check. Dragon to ground up. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground, come check. And SpaceX, this is Brazilian on Dragon to ground. How copy? I hear you loud and clear. How me? And we've got you loud and clear as well. And if you could pass along the folks, we have a gorgeous view of the International Space Station. Ah, oh, that is great to hear. Wish we could see it too. Thanks for letting us know, and we'll certainly pass that along. Well, when you guys get our tablets back, you just might find some photos on it. Excellent to hear. We look forward to it. Thanks. As you heard, Dragon Resilience has now exited the approach ellipsoid, that imaginary ellipsoid measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers in the same family as the keep out sphere, which we saw them depart earlier. Uh, and we also heard them that they said they have a beautiful view of the International Space Station. So our hypothesis was right. They were definitely getting some last glimpses outside of the windows. Yeah, I'm quite jealous. Uh, they probably have the best views in town. Uh, <laughs> next up is the third departure burn and what we call departure burn two. Um, that's coming up at, at about uh, around 6.27 p.m. Pacific time. Um, it's going to be 44 seconds in duration and it uses a combination of service section thrusters and forward bulkheads. Um, so this is done at the orbital apogee, the lowest uh, point in Dragon's uh, lower to lower Dragon's perigee to below the space station to start bringing it beneath and in front of the station's orbit. And as you mentioned, that'll be depart burn two, uh, but it's really the third departure burn that we've seen. Right. Well, we had two short undock burns that helped us break the stiction and then begin moving away from the International Space Station. Uh, and then afterward, we had depart burn zero lasting about 16 seconds and depart burn one lasting 21 seconds. Those are bringing these uh, vehicle up and over the International Space Station and then depart burn two, as you mentioned, coming up at 628 Pacific time. That should uh, be about 44 seconds long. And then the final major departure burn is depart burn three. And we'll expect to see that at 714 p.m. Pacific or 21 or 214 GMT lasting just over a minute long. And SpaceX from Resilience, uh, all four suits are connected and in drying. We copy, thanks.
And that was uh, Mike Hopkins confirming that they have doffed or taken off their suits and currently drying. Uh, again, they will be putting them back on in a few hours from now in preparation for deorbit. But that graphic, um, so deorbit burn three, the last uh, burn, if you have joined us for last week's um, entry, uh, it's known as a sort of a coalyptic burn. And what that means is uh, after that burn is done, the Dragon vehicle will be at a constant 10 kilometers beneath the space station the entire way around its orbit. And then you get to its final deorbit burn where we'll, where we'll start to decrease the altitude and eventually uh, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And there are some you know, other sequences that uh, the vehicle will need to follow in order to uh, splash back down. The largest of these departure burns so far have well, the longest, I should say, will be Depart Burn 3, and that's coming in and just over a minute long, looks like 61 seconds. But the deorbit burn will last 16 minutes and 26 seconds, so about 16 and a half minutes of those four forward bulkhead Draco thrusters slowing Dragon down. And that'll be a retrograde firing, so those are pointing the thrusters in the direction that they're traveling, and this will change the perigee or the lowest point of their orbit and help them drop out of uh, orbit around the Earth. And so that's what really commits them to their splashdown location and to coming home. So we're continuing to track Dragon's journey back to Earth. Uh, this is a view of Johnson's uh, Space Center in Houston. Uh, we have a couple more questions from social media. Uh, do all astronauts at the ISS keep on the same time zone, uh, such as Eastern time zone or Pacific time zone? Um, yes, uh, they follow a Greenwich, a GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, so that is sort of the nice halfway point between a bunch of different uh, space agencies. So that is the time that um, you know they use. And you'll often see us referring, uh, calling out timelines in Pacific time zone, because that's where we're at. But we also try to throw in GMT uh, as well to make sure that uh, the international folks and the astronauts um, also get their timelines correct. And this question from Andrew, along with the members of Crew-1, what items return with the Crew Dragon capsule? Experiments, garbage, and space luggage? Uh, yes to those, not necessarily garbage. Uh, we, we have different needs on our different vehicles. And one of the great things about Crew Dragon is it allows us to bring home cold science or, or cold stowage, um, things that need to be in powered lockers, refrigerators, essentially. That way they can be delivered to Earth and, and given quickly to the researchers here on the ground that have uh, developed these investigations. So that is a lot of what returns with the Crew Dragon as well as you mentioned the crew one themselves and there might be a little bit of space luggage in there each of the crew members gets to take up some personal items um, and we don't necessarily know what those are because they are personal uh, but those come home with them as well and we saw earlier today when uh, the uh, astronauts were ingressing the capsule the cargo is really packed in there and trying to make uh, full use of, you know, all the volume inside of the capsule. There is some storage space underneath the seat at sort of the base of the uh, Dragon vehicle where they can uh, store um, some luggage as well. So yeah, so keep sending us these questions. Uh, I'm having a blast answering them. Uh, again, the hashtag is Launch America. And we have this one from Corey. Will the Crew-1 astronauts be able to look out the window as the capsule is returning through the atmosphere? Uh, well, the windows definitely don't close, so the windows, they would be able to see out of them, but their seats will be actuated or somewhat reclined uh, to about 40 degrees. So they'll be more so facing that upper hatch that we just saw them um, ingress or enter whenever they prepared to leave the space station. And those windows are on the sides of the forward hatch, or sorry, the side hatch, which is what they will exit later. So they won't really be in the uh, peripheral, maybe, of the astronauts, um, but who knows? They, they might, might be able to look really far down and see it through their corner of their eye, but uh, as Leah mentioned, the seats actually actuate up, and so what's going to be in front of them are those three touchscreen LEDs with a ton of important information, such as telemetry, entry angle, and those are all important things that I'm sure the astronauts need to monitor to make sure that uh, the Dragon vehicle is doing what it needs to uh, for re-entry. Uh, Another question here, are there Xbox or PlayStations on the International Space Station so astronauts can be gamers? I love this question. Um, I don't know if there are specifically gaming consoles. Um, 
uh, but uh, I, I mentioned this uh, last week, but there is an experiment, and, uh, and I hope you uh, like this decisive TV. There is an experiment where they're taking a high-performance computer and bringing it to the space station, and essentially what they're doing is powering it on for a year and seeing if radiation will affect its performance. So I don't know if that's a precursor to space gaming in the future. <laughs> that would be very cool. Um, uh, but we'll see. We'll see a year from now how that experiment turns out. Yeah, we unfortunately don't have any gaming consoles for them on the International Space Station. That sounds pretty fun, though. Yeah. Uh, but like we mentioned, they do have other things to do in their downtime. Some like to continue working on science. Uh, I think one of the most popular and favorite pastimes is looking out the window, yep. because who could blame them? Um, as well as sometimes they watch movies, they share meals, and we even know that they play instruments as well. Yeah, that would be cool. You have, you know, West Coast servers, East Coast servers, then you have a space server. <laughs> and you're gaming with astronauts. That could be the future. That'd be so cool. <laughs> this next question from Daniel. How do astronauts do laundry on the International Space Station? Well, uh, this should be encouragement for anyone who hates doing laundry. You don't have to do laundry on the International Space Station. You can uh, actually just throw your clothes away. So they don't throw them away after one wear. They do uh, try to reuse their clothing. Um, but because you know, we don't really have water that can be disposed of in that in that amount. Uh, we recycle all of our water on the International Space Station, and so we um, we don't have the opportunity to do laundry. So those burn up upon reentry on the Earth's atmosphere when we pack them along with other trash um, and, and garbage inside um, other vehicles like the Northrop Grumman Cygnus, um, and we just send that back, and it disintegrates in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, Taking out you, the trash. If you don't want to do laundry, just become an astronaut. Exactly. It's just that, that simple. And I love this little view. You can see a crew dragon there on the right side of your screen. Just a point of light continuing to move away from the International Space Station with the next burn coming up in about 20 minutes. Depart burn two, which should last 44 seconds. So again, that is the Dragon capsule. It is quite far from the International Space Station at this point. Again, it passed the, imag the two imaginary uh, areas, the Keep Out Sphere and the Approach Ellipsoid, continuing to distance itself in the vastness of space. <laughs> And we had an on-time undocking today. The command being sent right at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time and an undocking coming around five minutes later. Those hooks opening, umbilical detaching, and two short burns separating Crew Dragon Resilience from the International Space Station, where it has called home since November 15th. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, you can see flight controllers at their consoles monitoring all of the systems aboard the International Space Station. That's a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year job, uh, and that has been for over 20 years now because that's the amount of time that we've had people living in space. So if you are under 20 years old, there has never been a day that uh, you've been alive without humans in space. Yeah, I believe the International Space Station just had its 20th anniversary last year and celebrated that. Uh, I saw some flags uh, from previous um, uh, views of, you know, the 20th anniversary of the International Space Station. Quite a long time. It's been orbiting the Earth over and over and over again. Um, you know, when it was initially conceptualized, uh, the space station was essentially built by sending you know, a piece at a time and attaching it uh, one piece at a time. And it's sort of become, uh, you know, the orbiting laboratory that it is now uh, over 300 feet uh, long. And um, if you look at the solar arrays, they're over 110 feet uh, wide, so to speak. Uh, but it is a, quite a large laboratory with a lot of modules and a lot of science uh, happening on board it. And a good way to uh, to make it visual is if you put the International Space Station on top of an American football field, it would reach from end zone to end zone. Wow. So that, that shows just how big it is. Yeah. Uh, I love when the astronauts are outside on a spacewalk and they are so small in comparison to the uh, to the, the solar rays in the background. It's right. fascinating. And Crew Dragon is now approximately 3.3 kilometers away from the International Space Station. Still has quite a ways to go home, but everything going well so far. 
with two of those departure burns having been completed. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned before, uh, since undocking, we're going to be live with you the entire way to Splashdown and crew recovery. So, um, you know, uh, a couple of sequences coming up here in the next couple hours, but it'll definitely get exciting towards uh, the last couple hours with um, the parachutes deploying and the, you know, trunk jettison and deal work burn and all that. Um, and if you're wondering what the crew themselves are doing inside the Crew Dragon right now, as we've mentioned, this is a completely autonomous vehicle, so they shouldn't have to do really anything. Uh, they should get the opportunity to sit back. As we heard, they're getting some last views of the International Space Station, which they've called home for the past several months. Um, I'm sure maybe we'll try a couple of extra backflips in microgravity, um, but they are out of their suits and should get the chance to relax and monitor that data. Uh, they may not make any commands of the vehicle, and they shouldn't have to uh, because it is autonomous, but they can watch those three uh, touchscreen displays and see how everything is performing, how they, uh, where they are in relativity to the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Dragon vehicle does the bulk of the heavy lifting, and this is especially important because uh, later on, uh, as part of their journey home, we'll, we'll be entering sort of a communications blackout period where the plasma buildup on uh, the bottom of the capsule will sort of interfere or prevent communications to and from Dragon. Uh, but have no fear, the Dragon is essentially flying itself at that, at that point, and the crew can, again, just monitor the data that's being fed uh, to them. Uh, and the Dragon vehicle could really take care of itself and uh, knows where it wants to go and can make uh, those adjustments to make sure that it's hitting its targeted landing site. We just talked about they're out of their suits. They're not having to wear them right now. Right. Um, and I thought about it. We mentioned spacewalks for a second. So we could talk a little bit about how these suits are different uh, than the ones that they put on for spacewalks. This crew completed or was part of five spacewalks while they were on the International Space Station, all taking place earlier this year. And we're very familiar with seeing those, what appear to be very large. Uh, right, the classic bulky, white. Sort of, yeah, the yeah. classic white space suit. We call those extravehicular mobility units units, and they're essentially their own little spacecraft because they have comms, they have uh, cooling, and they have, you know, mobility, and the astronauts can all control that on the suit. Um, and these are, these SpaceX suits are not meant to be extravehicular suits, but more intravehicular. Right. Uh, they can protect the crew in the event of a depressurization or even a fire but uh, they are not the same as going out and, and moving around the International Space Station for several hours at a time in the vacuum of space. Right, they really serve to protect the crew inside the vehicle in case there was a depressurization event, um, you know, there's air being fed and it, the suit will get pressurized and sort of can detect that on its own. Um, outside of vehicles, outside of the International Space Station, the environment is quite harsh, extremely cold, um, you have radiation from the sun, and that's where those EMUs are, are necessary with those, you know, really cool visors um, in order to perform the work that needs to get done on those extensive um, spacewalks. So the suits, while cool, uh, really serve a function inside the, the vehicle. Another view of Crew Dragon. And now uh, looking 4.2 kilometers away from the International Space Station. Very, very looks a bit awesome lonely, view. right? It it's does. Just, it's just this speck in, in this blackness. Um, and we're under 15 minutes away from their next burn, Depart Burn 2, actually 14 minutes to be specific. But it does. It looks very small when you think about uh, yeah. the scope of the Earth. I think about that sometimes. Yeah. And as we mentioned earlier, that bottom portion is not returning to Earth. Um, the top portion, the capsule, that's the pressurized section and where all of our crew members are seated. Um, and then that's just us moving the cameras on the space station again. These, that's not a crew dragon making any <laughs> super very, sudden movements. Very quick if, if it did that. <laughs> um, but that, that trunk at the bottom will be jettisoned and will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. And that's a great space for bringing up things uh, you know, upon launch. The crew or the cargo dragon vehicle now looks very similar to this vehicle, and um, so we can expect to see solar arrays in that trunk portion later this summer. Yeah, the, the trunk uh, right now there's an umbilical that feeds power and telemetry from the trunk to the capsule, and so it is uh, it, it still serves a purpose right now. But later on, again, uh, uh, it is important that we expose the uh, heat shield at the base of the capsule of Dragon prior to re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, so that way that that 
uh, pica material uh, can start to absorb and protect the capsule from the extreme uh, temperatures upon reentry. Everything has moved along right on the timeline for Crew Dragon today. We saw hatch closure earlier and then undocking the command being sent at 5.30 p.m. Pacific. Separation coming just a few minutes later. Two departure burns having already been completed and the Crew Dragon outside of the keepout sphere and the approach ellipsoid now coming up uh, on 4.6, 4.7 kilometers away from the International Space Station. And as we mentioned, we are coming up on the second, or I should say the third deorbit burn, or <laughs> not deorbit burn, departure burn. <laughs> Only one of those deorbit burns, but that third departure burn uh, it will last 44 seconds. Uh, and speaking of deorbit burns, we have a question here. Uh, does Crew Dragon utilize Super Draco engines to perform the deorbit burn? And also, in what type of scenario can Super Draco be used other than the abort scenario? Um, right now, the Super Draco is mainly used for an abort scenario, right? Luckily for us, we've never had to use it, although we've tested it extensively. As for the first question, does Crew Dragon use the Super Draco engines to perform deorbit burn? It does not. Um, it's the uh, Draco engines. There's 12 of them at the service section, and then an additional four um, sort of at the bottom of the nose cone, which is currently open right now in the, in the bulkhead, uh, those four thrusters at the top of Dragon, so to speak, will be what um, initiates uh, the deorbit burn. So no to the Super Draco um, engines. We just use the, the 16 Dracos um, in order to maneuver Dragon, not only for, for the deorbit burn, but for all the undocking sequences um, as well. And after we complete that deorbit burn, uh, as Andy mentioned, those thrusters under the nose cone, that's what's going to be used for the deorbit burn. We will close the nose cone uh, and protect the hatch that the crew members have ingressed and egressed from to and from the International Space Station. Uh, so we can protect that and for future reusability of this capsule. And we are continuing to answer your questions with the hashtag Launch America. So keep sending those in if you're on Twitter and we will do our very best to answer them. Coming up now, about uh, nine minutes away from Depart Burn 2. So the crew after Depart Burn 2 is done around uh, 7 p.m. PST. They will have a meal, uh, their sort of single and um, last meal to, on spa in space, so to speak. Um, they'll have that around 7 p.m. and then do an inventory of Dragon before, again, we get to that final phase um, where we start to do the Dior burn and um, splash down later in off the coast of Panama City. Sounds pretty fun to have a picnic in Crew Dragon. Right, they already have the cool views as they've uh, told us and now they get uh, catered meals too. <laughs> I'm, again, becoming increasingly jealous of the astronauts. And these are a little bit different than what they've been dining on for the last few months aboard uh, the International Space Station. These are MREs, essentially meals ready to eat, uh, meaning that you can open the package and, and it's there, it's, it's ready. Stick a spoon in it, no heating it up, nothing needed. Um, but on the International Space Station, they do have a lot of thermostabilized food uh, that they are able to um, re rehydrate and uh, put water in to, to restabilize it, I guess you can say. Um, and that gives them the hot meals that we think are so important while they're in space to uh, keep them enjoying breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. A quick question from Melissa. How long until splashdown? So it is currently targeted for 11.56 p.m. Pacific time. So depending where you're at, Melissa, um, it could be very late tonight or very early in the morning. So either way, it's about five and a half hours from now, but uh, don't Dragon, worry. SpaceX on Dragon to ground. The ground is go for depart burn two. And SpaceX from Resilience, we copy go for depart burn two. And please let us know when you are ready for us to come back on board with video. Okay, SpaceX uh, from Resilience, you're good to come on board and uh, we've turned the suit fan off. Suit drying is complete. Copy suit drying complete and we'll come back on board, thanks.
These views of Crew Dragon now 5.8 kilometers away from the International Space Station, a little over three and a half miles. And uh, we just heard them discussing with the core, the crew operations and resource engineer here at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California, about coming back on the vehicle. So we have not had views inside the vehicle since they really began doffing or taking off their suits. Uh, we do like to give them that privacy. So they gave them permission to come back on board the vehicle, meaning we might get some views inside. Uh, but right now, this is a pretty spectacular view of Crew Dragon now separated from the International Space Station. And we're looking for that to part burn two. We heard teams are go for that. Coming up around 628 Pacific time. Should last about 44 seconds. Depart burn two, even though has the number two. It is the third depart burn so far. Things really seem to have been moving quickly. Uh, yeah. Crew Dragon undocked about 50, five zero minutes ago. And so far we've had those three or two depart burns. This will be the third coming up shortly. It'll be using a combination of those service section thrusters around the base of the capsule and those forward bulkhead thrusters, uh, which are underneath the nose cone. And I think I can see the nose cone open just a little bit. Um, yeah, it's that circular, I think it's that circular piece right on top. Um, right, that's exactly it. And it's just fascinating that even from that distance, we can still get yeah. a good view. That'll remain open, as we mentioned, until it's time uh, for, or until afterward, uh, the deorbit burn is complete. So we are continuing to track Dragon, uh, as seen on screen. Uh, today, the splashdown will be at nighttime uh, off the coast of Panama City, Florida. Again, that is the first nighttime splashdown since the Apollo 8 mission uh, in 1975. The first trip of humans around the moon. Yes. Fascinating. Uh, it's been quite a while, so very excited um, to see uh, Dragon returning back to Earth uh, and in, in moonlight. And you might be able to tell, but it looks like Crew Dragon has moved a position a little bit. Uh, it has, it is maneuvering to the next altitude for this upcoming uh, depart burn two, making sure it's in the, or I should say burn attitude, is in the proper position for those thrusters to fire and keep it on track for that splashdown off the coast of Panama City, Florida. And now we are looking at about five minutes until depart burn two. Now we've got a really zoomed in view. You can clearly see that nose cone open. Crew Dragon 6.5 kilometers away from the International Space Station. Um, so uh, we talked about the crew sort of preparing uh, and performing a bunch of checks uh, to make sure that they are on docking, uh, in, undocking on time. But Dragon itself also, when it's docked at the International Space Station, often spends time in sort of a low power mode. And so Dragon also had a wake up call a few days ago and had its own system checkouts uh, to make sure that everything was a go. The life support systems were good. Um, the GNC, the comms were good. Um, so it's been Quite a journey. Station Houston on two for Toma for crew quarters. And so I was saying it's been quite a journey for not just the crew but Dragon, but uh, we have video back on board the. Uh, Crew One Capsule, Capsule Resilience. Uh, though again, those are the three touchscreen um, uh, displays that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom there are a, a bunch of dedicated buttons. So very important functions like deploying shoots or cutting the shoots after deployment have a dedicated button to them. Uh, and then there are a bunch of displays and uh, views that the astronauts themselves can use to get information on their journey home. And as we uh... 
as we know, all of those things are autonomous. Uh, those shoots should deploy on their own, and the uh, shoots should be cut as well on their own to prevent the uh, capsule from moving any more in the water. However, those buttons are there just in case. We always like to have backups. We call it fault tolerance. Uh, so the crew is able to initiate both shoot deployment and cutting those shoots if necessary. This view inside Crew Dragon Resilience. Looks like Victor Glover's in the background over there getting a bite to eat. And uh, it looks like we have people in the seats, but not quite. Those are just the suits. <laughs> I had to take a second look because I thought that <laughs> they were also in the suits as well. Um, they are uh, hooked up to the umbilicals and were drying. And uh, we got confirmation a few minutes ago that the drying has been complete. But yes, I, had to I took a, a quick second because one of them uh, had the visors down. Um, uh, I saw, or maybe it was the backdrop of the the, the, the back of the helmet, but uh, yes. the suits are in place. There's no one in them right now. The crew is, um, uh, looks like they are uh, chatting about and or are getting ready for the next departure burn. Yes, that's very funny. I mean, that's the best place to store the suits, absolutely. Makes sense. And those are the three displays that we were talking about. Those are touch screens. And in the center one, you can see uh, the Earth, and they are able to monitor where Crew Dragon is in relativity to the International Space Station uh, in relation to their splashdown, splashdown location. They're able to monitor the burns. And as we mentioned, we've got one coming up in just about two minutes. That'll be Depart Burn 2, lasting 44 seconds. And that is the Dragon vehicle that, again, the crew members that we just saw, they are in that vehicle and are um, uh, in space right now, continuing to make their way back to Earth. This vehicle has been in space uh, since November 15th of last year. And after about a six month stay, it's finally making its way home. Um, we have about one minute until depart burn two. The International Space Station, that's where the view was coming from. Uh, this one back inside the capsule. But they are both flying about uh, northeast of New Zealand, about 267 statute miles. Of course, Crew Dragon just a few miles off of that. We are standing by for depart burn two. And there's Soichi Noguchi in the background. Looks like this might be their dinner, their evening meal or... Mm. or snack at least uh, oh, we just saw a, that last uh shot was um mike hopkins and then right before him uh, we saw victor glover to the right hand side interesting thing about this vehicle um later on this year we'll, we'll launch uh, the astronauts as part of the crew three program uh, this capsule will be the capsule that uh, they will be sitting in so it'll be refurbished when it lands uh, make sure that everything is working as uh, as planned and then we will send this back up later on this fall. And as you saw with Crew Dragon Endeavor, uh, the capsule does not change its name once it has been named. It, Crew 2, their capsule was uh, dubbed Endeavor by Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley last year on the Demo 2 mission. And Crew 1 named this capsule Resilience. So those names will live along with the vehicles. Dragon SpaceX burn complete, nominal burn. And SpaceX uh, resumes copies. That was depart burn two, a 44 second burn, exactly where uh, we needed to be coming at 6.28 p.m. Pacific time using a combination of those service section and forward bulkhead thrusters. That was done at the orbital ap apogee, which is the highest point in Dragon's orbit, and it's lower ring, the perigee, the lowest part in the orbit, to below the space station. So those first burns took us up and over the space station. This will take us down and under it. Uh, this will start bringing it beneath and in front of the station's orbit. And then, uh, as we've seen, the crew has begun having their last mm. meal on Dragon. A bit early. A bit early <laughs> before returning to Earth, but... How can you tell somebody when they're hungry not right. to eat? Uh, they have MREs, but they also have some snacks on board as well. I'm not sure what the snacks are, but they must be good. Um, at about 7.14 p.m. Pacific time, we'll have the fourth 
and final departure burn. Um, it's called departure and burn three, but it is the fourth one. Um, and that will put the Dragon roughly co-elliptic with the International Space Station, uh, just 10 kilometers beneath it the entire way around the Earth. And it's now 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, meaning it has been exactly one hour since the undock command was issued to Crew Dragon. Everything moving on time and on schedule so far with Crew Dragon's undocking and uh, those two short burns to break the stiction. And then three departure burns having been completed so far with the fourth, which is known as departure burn three, uh, left to go. That's coming up, as you mentioned, Andy, at 7.14 p.m. Pacific time. So we've got about 45 minutes until that depart burn three. It'll be the longest of the burns that we've seen so far at 61 seconds, just over a minute. Uh, but it's nothing in comparison to that 16 and a half minute deorbit burn that we'll see later tonight. Right. And, and once we start that deorbit burn, uh, we're committed to making sure that uh, Dragon is splashing down safely. We have a primary site, uh, Panama City, uh, off the coast of Panama City. We also have the um, alternate site uh, off the coast of Tampa. So uh, you ha we have personnel and ships and boats standing by to make sure that you know all of the recovery operations are done smoothly and quickly uh, to make sure that the crew um, is safely egressed from the capsule and uh, attended to and um, you know, make their journey back to Earth a very pleasant one. This view of Crew Dragon Resilience floating in space, targeted for a splashdown off the coast of Panama City, Florida. And these views are coming from the International Space Station. And now that the Crew Dragon has departed, we had 11 astronauts and cosmonauts on board for a week there. And we're back down to seven crew members aboard the orbiting laboratory. That's NASA's Mark Vandehei, Roscosmos, Oleg uh, Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov, as well as the Crew 2 astronauts who just arrived last week. That's Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur uh, of NASA, um, Aki Hoshide of Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Toma Peske of the European Space Agency. So nothing short of an international space station. Right. The International Space Station is just to the east uh, of New Zealand right now. It continues to orbit at over 17,000 miles per hour around the Earth. As we mentioned, that the orbit burn is what really brings us home, commits us to coming home and splashing down at that very specific location off the coast of Panama City. But at this point in the orbit, uh, we could change that if we needed to. The uh, Crew Dragon can be reprogrammed with the burns necessary in case we needed to go to our alternate splashdown site, which currently is Tampa, or off the coast of Tampa, I should say, um, or any other splashdown sites if, if necessary, um, if some weather were to move in. So it's nice to have that flexibility with Crew Dragon uh, on these deorbits. But everything looking good in that primary splashdown site. And again, as we mentioned, the first nighttime splashdown of a commercial crew mission and the first for NASA since 1968. Right. And uh, you bring up an important part, uh, the constant monitoring of weather and, um, you know, the landing sites. We talked to NASA's um, commercial crew program manager, Steve Stitch, earlier, and one of the things that he was emphasizing was it's constantly monitoring weather. We tried, uh, we looked at weather on the 28th and uh, decided to wave off. We looked at weather yesterday on the 30th, decided to wave off until the sea states and winds were in an ideal condition for the crew to return safely. So that is something that, again, we are in space right now orbiting the Earth and we can make decisions to potentially switch up landing sites if needed. Uh, but again, we are going to be monitoring all the way down to the wire to make sure that this crew and the capsule have the safest possible return, even though it is a nighttime um, splashdown. So uh, the crew has, again, begun eating their last meal in space before returning home. Uh, next up, we are awaiting the fourth and final departure burn, departure burn three. 
um, called Departure Burn 3. The thrusters, uh, we used a combination of service section and the forward bulkhead thrusters, again, lasting about a minute, 61 seconds. Uh, this will circularize, circularize Dragon's orbit and put it roughly co-elliptic with the station, approximately 10 kilometers lower in altitude. And while we wait, let's check in with Brandy Dean at the Johnson Flight Control Center. Brandy? Thanks so much, Andy. Things have quieted down a little bit around here, but the team is still watching, following along with the Dragon as it makes its way away from the International Space Station. They're led tonight by Flight Director Anthony Varia. Since the Dragon's departure, uh, the team here in Houston uh, does have a few roles to play. Uh, the TOPO, or Trajectory Operations and Planning Officer, is continuing to monitor Dragon's path on the lookout for any conjunctions. That's chance of any space debris ca crossing the Dragon's path and uh, causing a, an issue during their flight home. We also have representatives from NASA's Flight Operations Directorate on console. They serve as an information clearinghouse for all NASA's personnel who are supporting Splashdown. And they also provide uh, input should any changes be needed to, make, be, needed to be made to the uh, cruise plan. There's also our Space Flight Meteorology Group. They're actively providing weather data to the joint NASA and SpaceX teams as we keep an eye on the uh, area for splashdown today. And finally, our LSO, or Landing Support Officer, is on standby in the event we run into any major issues that would cause Dragon to end up at an unsupported uh, splashdown location where we'd call up support from our Department of Defense colleagues. So we'll continue to monitor from here in Mission Control Houston, and I'll send it back to you, Leah and Andy and Hawthorne. And thank you for the update, Brandy. While the crew eats and we await the final departure burn, we'd like to give you a quick overview of what entry would look like for the Crew-1 astronauts. So after Crew Dragon Resilience has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy to slow the spacecraft's descent. First will be the two Drogue chutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide uh, Crew Dragon to its first contact with Earth since launching on no November 15th of uh, last year. The two Drogue chutes are sort of conical in nature, and then the main chutes are um, orange and white. Um, Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressures and position sensors on the capsule detect they are at the right speed and altitude. Vehicle velocity at Drogue deploy is approximately 350 miles per hour and deploy at about 18,000 feet. Vehicle velocity at the main parachute deploy is approximately 119 miles per hour. So you can see those Drogues have already done quite a good job at slowing it down. And they deploy at about 6,500 feet. And when the Crew Dragon splashes down in the water, the velocity of the vehicle should be approximately 16 miles per hour. So the highest G load the crew will experience during reentry is around three to five Gs. That's about uh, what they experience on ascent as well. So Crew Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of a material known as PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon uh, Ablator. Uh, First-gen PICA was developed uh, by NASA for studying and sample, sampling comets within our solar systems. SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop PICA X, which was the second generation product used on all of Dragon 1 CRS missions that successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions. PICA 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2, uh, the crew and the cargo versions, with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down cost and mass. The remainder of Crew Dragon capsule is comprised primarily of SpaceX prior, prior, proprietary ablative material. It's another class of thermal protection, which is lighter weight versus PICA, and protects the underlying composite structure during reentry to ensure the structural capabilities are maintained. And while Crew Dragon will experience temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit during peak reentry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS or the thermal protection systems, coupled with the ECLIS, which is the environmental cooling and life support system in the pressurized interior, will ensure that Mike, Victor, Shannon, and Suichi stay cool and comfortable during all phases of reentry through splashdown. Yeah, the PICO materials is 
quite interesting. It's it has the density uh, of about balsa wood, and and for those that have taken any type of martial arts, balsa wood is that very lightweight um, sort of training board that you know you start to break when you're you're first entering martial arts. So that material, that very um, uh, not very dense material, is able to shield and protect the capsule and the astronauts from over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit of um, you know entry temperatures. Uh, it's pretty pretty wild. Uh, Sorry, oh, I had the opportunity to hold one of those uh, tiles yeah. when I was at Kennedy Space Center one time, and it was surprisingly very light. I was shocked, uh, and I saw a demonstration of someone with a blowtorch and had their hand on the other side oh boy. Uh, and, and heating up the tile, and, and we're perfectly fine. So it's fascinating. So the, the, the way that that's comprised is uh, the, the base of the capsule is made of carbon fiber, and then there is an epoxy or um, sort of an adhesive, and then you're, you're putting these pica tiles on the bottom of it. And so that, that is what uh, will enter first, uh, sort of, so to speak, uh, when we have the Dragon capsule re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, and that's taking the bulk of the um, friction and heat um, as the Dragon capsule um, uh, interacts with the atmosphere. So following Crew-1 return, SpaceX will launch Commercial Resupply Mission 22, or CRS-22, uh, to, to the space station to deliver cargo and supplies to the Crew-2 crew, uh, which uh, uh, were sent up there uh, just a week ago. It will automatically dock to the International Docking Adapter 3 at the Zenith port of the Harmony module. Again, that's where this Crew-1 capsule just left from. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Crew 2 lifted off from the coast of Florida on April 22nd, just a few days ago. And before Crew 2 returns home, they will have um, to hand off the baton to the next crew arriving at the orbiting lab on Crew Dragon, the Crew 3 crew. And that mission is targeted to launch this fall and will carry Crew Dragon Commander Raja Shari on his first space flight, pilot Tom Marshburn, and who they are both of NASA, and mission specialist Matthias Maurer of the European Space Agency, as well as a fourth crew member who we will, we will be adding soon. These Crew 3 astronauts will also complete a six-month mission as expedition crew members aboard the space station. They'll be joined there by three additional crewmates who will launch on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, which means seven people will be on the station at one time, allowing us to effectively double the amount of science conducted in space. So uh, this will be Chari, uh, Shari's first trip to space, but he has more than 2,500 hours of flight time as a test pilot. The U.S. Air Force Colonel is also a member of NAS NASA's Artemis team and is eligible for assignment to a future mission to the moon. Crew 3 will be Marshburn's third visit to the space station and his second long-duration mission. He flew on STS-127 and Expedition 34 and 35. Marshburn is also a medical doctor who once served as a flight surgeon and medical operations lead for the space station. And like uh, Jari uh, Maurer will be making his first trip to space with the Crew 3 mission. He has extensive experience in engineering and research, and he uh, has spent 16 consecutive days in an underwater laboratory as part of NASA's Extreme Environment Missions operations. Again, that is a preview of Crew 3, which will launch uh, later on this fall. And as we saw recently, uh, those views inside the capsule, the crew is currently eating their last meal in space before they head home. So our, our next burn coming up and our final departure burn, that's departure burn three. That'll be at 7.14 p.m. Pacific time, so about 30 minutes from now. Uh, that'll be another combination of those service section and forward bulkhead thrusters propelling Dragon, and it should last about 61 seconds. So this will circularize, circularize Dragon's orbit and put it roughly co-elliptic with the International Space Station. Uh, and for those just joining us, uh, on screen is a view of Johnson Space Center. Um, we are in the middle of Crew-1 departure and return back to Earth. Um, we are waiting on that fourth and final departure burn. Uh, we are also taking questions throughout the night. So if you have any questions, use the hashtag Launch America. Uh, we have one here. How many Draco engines are there on uh, Crew Dragon? So there are 16 total Draco engines. There's 12 in the service sections. And there's an additional four on the forward bulkhead. There's also eight Super Draco engines not used in today's missions uh, that can be used for in-flight aborts, and those are 
um, a bit stronger and will protect the astronauts in case of an anomaly on the pad during liftoff. And Ethan wants to know if there are any cameras on the exterior of the Dragon capsule. There is a camera underneath the nose cone as well. It's a center line camera, essentially, and that helps uh, us line up directly with the international docking adapter on that docking port. Um, and so we uh, use that on the way up. We haven't seen any views of it tonight, though, if you are wondering. The views that we've seen of the capsule uh, from the exterior are from the International Space Station. Yeah, one, one thing to note, as part of the undocking sequence, after we close Dragon's hatch and before we close the APAS hatch, um, uh, the Crew 2 commander, Shane Kimbrough, affixed a docking target to the opposite side of the APAS hatch. So not necessarily important for the undocking portion of crew, but uh, definitely important for, for the next vehicle coming on board. So that way they know um, it's essentially like a, a cross hatch or a target. So that way their cameras can align up and know exactly where they are in relative position to the International Space Station and get a good docking procedure. Will wants to know how hot does the inside of the capsule get during reentry, which is a great question because we've talked about how the outside reaches, it can be up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. So the inside is kept nice and cool. Um, the astronauts are in their suits at that time as well, so they also have cool air flowing through their suits. And the inside of the cabin also has cool air um, having been disconnected from that external radiator. And so uh, I think it's around 85 degrees inside. Yeah, the, uh, certainly upon reentry, when the outside temperatures can get upwards of 3,000 or 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, the inside is expected to, to warm up a little bit. One of the cool things is the suit itself, and again, it's hooked up to an umbilical that uh, provides um, uh, Electri electronics and um, also nitrox or, or a combination of nitrogen and, and oxygen for the astronauts to uh, have a habitable environment. Uh, that will automatically detect if temperatures get too high and start to purge the suit, keeping the astronauts nice and cool. Um, uh, that way, you know, they're not uh, sweating on, on re-entry. So uh, it, they, they should be very comfortable upon re-entry. Uh, next question. Um, from Ty Hill, how does orbit, how does the orbit burn feel on the uh, Dragon capsule? Um, I don't... Well, for these burns, as we've seen, the crew are out of their seats uh, and out of their suits, so it, it really doesn't feel like much is happening for them. Um, it might feel like if you were in a car and the car started moving a little bit faster, right. uh, but not necessarily so much that you'd be thrown back in your seat. Otherwise, we would have the astronauts moving in the capsule. So uh, so they, they don't typically feel really anything during these burns. One thing to note, uh, particularly about the deorbit burn, so uh, once we start it, it, it will at the end of it, we'll be entering the Earth's atmosphere. And once we get into the atmosphere, um, you know, Bob and Doug had described the dragon sort of coming to life. And so uh, when you get to the atmosphere, you start to hear those sounds again. There's a lot of friction and heat. Um, but in space, the engines work a little bit differently. They sound a little bit differently. It's not very, it's not like the typical combustion engine that you would um, ex uh, hear or experience here on Earth. Um, you actually hear sort of a, a clicking, and that's just the hypergolic fuel being fed into the motors. Um, and so uh, when the engines and these departure burns are active, the astronauts should hear sort of a clicking, and they, like Leo said, they'll, they'll, they'll feel the change in velocity, but not necessarily the sort of like roaring engine that you would expect um, at like a Falcon 9 liftoff or something like that. And it's also not as noisy as you might expect on an airplane, because right. like we said, there's, there's not really air that's being processed or uh, pushed against when we have these burns. So this question from Autumn, how quickly do the astronauts' family members get to see them after landing? That has been a long-awaited moment for these yeah. family members and for the astronauts as well. Uh, and it's very, it's really a quick turnaround. They should get to see them tomorrow morning at Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. Uh, the crew members will ride a helicopter after being loaded onto the recovery ship, and uh, they'll be taken back to Florida um, and then board that NASA plane to Ellington Field. So we expect them to get in early tomorrow morning and be able to see their family members. And one interesting thing to note, we saw um, uh, the astronauts from Crew 2 
at the International Space Station uh, this morning or this afternoon, helping the crew and members get into Dragon. And they were sort of zipping around. And, and remember, they've only been there for about a week. And so they described that, although it's, it's sort of like learning to walk again, you get used to it very quickly. Well, the same will happen when the astronauts return back to Earth. So they've been in microgravity for six months. The body will likely need some time to adjust, um, uh, not only to gravity, but also the equilibrium. Uh, microgravity does some funky things with your equilibrium. So uh, one thing after splashdown and we do recover the crew, you'll notice that they will be tended to by uh, medical staff. And that's to make sure everything is okay because you know after spending such a long time in space, the gravity can feel quite, uh, like, uh, quite heavy. And that's a great intro into this next question from Ezra, eight years old. Hi, Ezra, thank you so much for watching. Uh, wanting to know how stressful it is to be in space for so long. And that's a really interesting um, question. And it's something that we have to think about more and more as we send crew members on long duration missions, obviously here on the International Space Station, but as well as we think about going to the moon and Mars. So things that are very important are PMCs or private medical conferences. And it's very common for the astronauts, it's actually uh, on their timelines multiple times. Um, and even on the way uphill last week with Crew 2, they had a private medical conference just to check in on how they're feeling. And so they get the opportunity to talk with a doctor here on the ground, a uh, flight surgeon, and, and relay any concerns that they have either uh, about stresses on their body and how they're feeling or uh, just mentally as well, just making sure that, you know, being away from home so long. Uh, they are still feeling good and able to uh, fully give their off to the mission. And it would be good to mention too, um, the astronauts have to follow a very strict schedule, right? So every day is two hours of exercise. Every five minutes are essentially planned for the astronauts and um, they have, they're supporting hundreds if not thousands of different types of experiments. Um, and on top of that, you know, they're in getting used to the microgravity environment of space. Um, so uh, they are quite busy, uh, but you know if if the images on social media tell uh, will tell anything, they seem to be very happy there. Um, seems like they're uh, really happy to support all of these you know different scientific endeavors, and um, it seems like they're just having a blast. So it, I'm sure it balances each other out. The sort of rigorous schedule with you know the other side of like you get to do stuff that really no one else gets to do. And mentally as well, you know, we want to make sure that the astronauts still have communication with their families. And so they have the opportunity uh, weekly and multiple times a week to either do a video conference with their families as well as give them a call. Uh, so they're able to keep up with everything that's going on here on Earth. I actually heard one time about one astronaut whose son was playing hockey. And so they took the uh, tablet to the hockey game and were recording the hockey game for the astronaut on the space station who was getting to watch it. So I love that they're able to to keep in the loop like that. Yeah. Um, next question for Matt. Uh, what purpose do the crew iPads or tablets serve? Um, so a lot of the things, it's, it's their schedule. They can also take pictures and record a bunch of data on there to send to ground um, in case they need support in any, in, in any type of way. But it's really, you know, if, if you think about, um, you know, 80 years ago, we had you know pen and pad or pa pencil and pad so to speak. So this is the new pencil and pad. It's, <laughs> it's how they, they they really do work and 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 get you know the schedule for the next uh, upcoming milestones for their mission. And even less than eighty, you know, thirty years ago, flying the the space shuttle, we had just stacks of paper uh, that had the information for the crew. And so for this one, you know, we can see them on the thighs of the astronauts sometimes, and that gives them the opportunity to keep up with what's next in the mission um, and help them monitor that. Um, we have a next question here. It says, this is so fascinating. Uh, how many crew members are on board the Dragon. So there's currently four. There is the commander, Mike Hopkins, uh, the pilot, Victor Glover, and then we have two mission specialists, Shannon Walker and Soichi Noguchi. Um, uh, so these four are returning home after their six month journey. We also sent four as part of the Crew 2 program last week. The Dragon capsule itself can fit up to seven, although we've never launched that many people um, uh, as part of the uh, capsule program. Uh, when we did the Demo 2 mission with Bob and Doug, we just sent them. And so there was some empty space um, in the, the capsule as well. 
Tassara asks, what is the big loop? That's a great question. We've heard a lot of that talk uh, from the core here, reporting to Dragon on the big loop or reporting to, uh, or the crew members reporting back on the big loop. And uh, that's when the communication is being routed through the International Space Station as well. So we heard that that big loop was recently uh, cut. And so Crew Dragon is speaking directly to the ground now and not uh, really using the International Space Station for that. They're not in the mix anymore, I guess I should say, on that specific loop or uh, chat line. Yeah, and you'll hear a lot of communications back and forth between the ground team and the astronauts. Um, you know, there are a lot of milestones and checkpoints to make sure that everything goes smoothly. So over communication is certainly good. And you'll, you'll hear the beeps too, and those are Quindar tones um, uh, for the core to communicate with the astronauts and we, we try our best to pause and make sure that everyone can listen to the messages being relayed back and forth. Um, so uh, next question is, at what point in the mission is the trunk jettisoned? That is a great question. So currently it's scheduled uh, for 10.58 p.m. Pacific time, so uh, just about four hours from now. So um, after we complete our departure burns, the astronauts will don their suits again and prepare for re-entry. So the, um, there's an umbilical that connects the trunk uh, to the capsule and routes telemetry and power. And uh, one of the things that we want to make sure happens before we re-enter is we want to shed as much unneeded weight as, uh, as, as possible uh, to give the parachutes an easier time uh, to do their job and slow the vehicle down. So uh, we'll start to um, burn up unnecessary fuel. We'll, um, uh, uh, and then we'll also jettison the trunk. And after the deorbit burn, we're burning the, uh, the, the extra propellant and the um, trunk is jettisoned. The weight of the vehicle, the mass of the vehicle actually goes from 27,000 pounds to 21,000 pounds, so that's 6,000 pounds that you know the the um, the drogue chutes and the main chutes don't have to sort of uh, slow down. So that is important for us. And uh, to be specific, as you mentioned, that that umbilical uh, we call it claw separation, and so that disconnects the thermal control power and tele telemetry from Dragon uh, to the trunk, uh, and then the space card, the capsule itself will separate from the trunk. And this all happens before the deorbit burn. Um, so, so that comes on later in the mission, but before we really commit to coming home. And we're continuing to take your questions with the hashtag AskNASA. Just a little look back on the things that we've seen so far. Uh, the call to, or the uh, command for undocking came right on time at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, so just about an hour and a half ago, and we had physical separation of the vehicle just a few minutes later. Everything has been really on the timeline since yeah. then. We've completed three of those departure burns, and we're now waiting for the fourth, which should come in less than 20 minutes from now, around 7.14 p.m. Pacific time. So this is an animation of the four burns um, so we've completed three so far, and again, waiting on the fourth one. Uh, once we get uh, to the fourth one, uh, we're basically going to be co-elliptic with the um, space station about 10 kilometers beneath it. Uh, and then we'll move on to the deorbit burn in a couple hours, and that will lower the orbit altitude enough where Dragon will start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, uh, eventually make its way through the atmosphere, um, uh, deploy its drogue shoots first, slowing the vehicle and stabilizing it, then eventually the main shoots, um, and then we'll have splashdown off the coast of, uh, right now, the pr primary site of Panama City, Florida. So when Crew Dragon begins that deorbit burn, it'll still be traveling about 17,500 miles an hour orbital velocity, uh, and that burn will help it drop out of orbit and into the Earth's atmosphere, slowing it down to about 350 miles per hour. At that point is when those drogue chutes will deploy once Crew Dragon reaches 18,000 feet above the Earth. And those drogue chutes uh, slowly deploy, will slow Crew Dragon down to about 119 
uh, miles per hour. And then we'll see those four main shoots. And those main shoots don't inflate right away. Uh, same thing with those drogue shoots. We'll see it take just a few seconds for them to fully inflate. And we don't want to cause any shock to the vehicle uh, or the parachute system. So, so it takes its time to inflate a little bit. But after that, uh, the Crew Dragon should be sailing about 16 miles per hour for a nice calm splashdown just off the coast of Panama City, Florida. Uh, after splashdown, uh, recovery operations begin. So a couple of things will happen. There are two fast boats, and they they move pretty quickly, um, that will head to the vehicle. Uh, the first one's job is to make sure that um, the vehicle integrity is generally safe and also start to detect for any uh, residual hypergolic vapors, which can be toxic to people. Uh, once that is all cleared, the second boat will come in and make sure that the chutes are no longer attached. Um, if they were attached, you know, we could run the risk of the winds pulling the, the vehicles in the ocean, just like a sailboat. And so they'll make sure that is good. And then we have a recovery vessel come in, and it essentially has a giant crane on it. It will um, hook the top of the Dragon and uh, basically hoist it onto the back of the boat. Uh, more checkouts will happen, and then eventually the crew crew uh, will open the hatch and say hi to the crew. Uh, one of the first people that will talk to the crew is uh, medical staff and make sure that everything is, is good from that standpoint. Uh, and then they'll uh, be uh, moved to a SpaceX for a couple of items. That was the ping from the core to the astronauts. Go ahead. The ground is go for depart burn three. Also, friendly reminder that you may now begin your fluid loading per your timeline. And you may also complete sections three and four of procedure four decimal seven zero zero at your convenience. Okay, go for the burn, depart three burn. We are go to start fluid loading and go for sections three and four of four dot seven hundred. Good read back. We heard the crew members get the go for depart burn three. And that's the final of these four departure burns, but certainly not the last burn we'll see today. And we expect to see departure burn three coming up in about 13 minutes from now, around 7.14 p.m. Pacific time or 2.14 GMT. We also, oh, sorry. So I was, sorry, I was uh, trying to finish my thoughts. Uh, so after the, um, the medical staff says hi to the crew, there's actually a medical um, portion of the medical section uh, dedicated uh, on the portion of the vessel, and the crew will continue further checkouts to make sure everything is good, uh, and then, uh, you know, start to make their way back to land. That's going to be the first time they're getting a, a breath of fresh air in over six months, uh, which uh, is probably certainly pretty exciting for them. And when we had uh, three crew members return earlier this month on Soyuz, it's, I love the look on their faces whenever they are pulled out of the capsule for the first time and they have sunlight on their face and uh, fresh air from, from the world around them. So uh, I know it has to be exciting. And once, as you mentioned, the first people to really speak with the crew members face to face once they return will be medical personnel. Uh, and as we've seen with all of our space missions, once the crew members are retrieved from the capsule, they will be loaded onto stretchers. Um, this is because they have been in space for the past six months and it can be a little bit difficult to walk. Uh, it's not that they couldn't, but we want to make sure, especially while on a boat, that they uh, are stable and um, that they're comfortable. So they will uh, get some medical checkouts aboard the boat itself and then take that helicopter back to Florida before boarding a NASA plane for Houston. Right. The, the stretcher um, is very similar to like the, the chairs that um, you'll see propped up after a land landing for a spacecraft like the Soyuz. Uh, it is sort of standard, right? We, we want to make sure that um, even though the astronauts might feel like they're strong enough, we, we're taking all precautions to make sure that, you know, they get checked out and everything before uh, they start to, you know, become Earthlings again.
So we are awaiting depart burn three coming up at 7.14 p.m. Pacific time, the last of those four departure burns. The astronauts, as we mentioned, they're having, they probably finished their dinner by now. Um, they are out of their suits, out of their seats. They are able to monitor the journey of Crew Dragon, but uh, they will need to get back in those suits and seats before our departure burn later on. We have another question here from Greg. How many Gs do the astronauts feel when entering the Earth's atmosphere? So we uh, expect them to feel about three to five Gs. So nothing unbearable, maybe even three Gs. Maybe you felt it on a roller coaster before. Um, and as Andy mentioned, it's pretty similar to what they experience on ascent as well. But of course, having experienced practically zero Gs over the last few months, um, that can be a little taxing. And so we heard them uh, discuss fluid loading and how they go for fluid loading. And this helps combat any maybe potential orthostatic intolerance or essentially dizziness that can occur as the blood rushes away from the head once you return to a gravity environment. We also got to look at the crew in those comfort garments, which are also uh, compression garments, essentially orthostatic garments. Those squeeze the legs and the lower half of the body to keep fluids moving um, into the upper part of the body. So it all helps our crew members feel better on the way down. I, I just I just looked up the highest G force experience on a roller coaster. It's twelve. So actually, <laughs> if you've ridden the uh, some really intense roller coasters, you're probably going to experience more G's wow. than what the astronaut experienced. Maybe for a, a shorter duration. Um, twelve. But yeah, I was not expecting that answer. So twelve G's out there is the record for highest G forces in a roller coaster. We have a question from Jamie asking, uh, the astronauts usually have to sleep shift for the trip up. Do they have to sleep shift for the trip home? Great question. It all depends on really the timeline for uh, undocking and splashdown because we want to work in the uh, ability for the crew to sleep while they're on Crew Dragon if need be. We're not seeing that today because it is a shorter undock to splashdown timeline. So the crew for this mission did have to sleep shift. Uh, they, they took about a 60 hour nap outside of their normal sleep time yesterday um, and then had their sleep overnight as well, waking up at about 7.45 a.m. Pacific time this morning um, before boarding Crew Dragon and, and coming home. And, and we mentioned um, uh, departure and re-entry. That, that process can take anywhere from, you know, six hours to 39 hours. So uh, we're definitely on the lower end of the duration. I'm sure the crew is super happy that, you know, instead of spending 39 hours, although the, the Dragon spacecraft is very cool with some really cool technologies, uh, I'm sure six and a half hours is the preferred duration over 39 hours. And again, they do have, we are again, monitoring weather. In the event that we do need to uh, wave off today's um, uh, return. They do have enough food and water up there to last three days and, uh, you know, sort of retarget a, another landing in that in that time period. So uh, even though things continue to look good and um, as um, Steve Stitch had said earlier, the winds are about three miles an hour at the primary landing site and the, the seas are uh, in a glass light state. So waves are just about one feet tall. Uh, pretty much ideal conditions. Things continue to look good, uh, but you know, weather is weather. So, um, in the event that things do shift, the, we do have some um, you know pr potential alternate paths that the crew could take, and there are supplies on board the Dragon spacecraft for them to um, you know be fine uh, while orbiting the Earth for that duration. Next question is from James. Do they keep a medical person continuously on the space station? Uh, and you can ask these questions with the hashtag Launch America if you're on Twitter. And I am sure that they would love to have a medical person continuously on the space station, but uh, that's that's just not the case, unfortunately. However, they do have constant communications with the ground. As we mentioned, uh, Mission Control is staffed 365 days a year, and part of those times we have a flight surgeon in the room, and they are always on call if the crew were to need to speak with someone. So um, they have all had training for various medical conditions, but there is not a specific designated medical person on board. Ace. As we did see, though, um, Maurer, who's flying this fall, was a medical doctor first, and so uh, right. essentially that is like having a, a doctor on board. Um, uh, the uh, Each of the astronauts do get assigned 
um, you know, specific medical staff for their duration and, and their mission. So, you know, when we're talking about the private medical conferences or the PMCs that they, that all the astronauts have regularly, um, it is in the same person. So they, they can assess their health from, you know, last week to, uh, for, to now and, and so on and so forth to make sure that, you know, there aren't any negative trends and, and they can be treated um, if needed appropriately. And I just misspoke. I have to correct myself. It was uh, Tom Marshburn is gotcha. the medical yep. doctor. So, okay. Yeah, that is quite nice to um, uh, sort of uh, be an astronaut and also be a doctor. Right. Uh, very accomplished people. Um, I would probably ask too many questions, though, always thinking there was something wrong with me when yeah. it's just normal space flight. Yeah. So again, we are uh, about five minutes away from the fourth and final departure burn. It's called Departure Burn 3, but it is the fourth burn. It will place the Dragon spacecraft roughly co-elliptic with the International Space Station, about 10 kilometers lower than it the entire way around the Earth. And then a few hours after that, we'll have um, claw separation, trunk uh, separation, and then the uh, deorbit burn, which is a beefy burn, lasting 16 minutes. These these departure burns that we've had have been sub one minute, and I think this last one's the longest, with just being one second uh, over a minute. But that deorbit burn to get us uh, back to, to Earth's atmosphere will will be 16 over 16 minutes. And that burn should begin at 11:03 Pacific time. Uh, that's 6:03 tomorrow GMT. We have another question. Do the astronauts have different spacesuits for different scenarios or is it just one suit? I love this question because I I just love the spacesuits. And <laughs> uh, we've seen those really sleek suits that are now in the seats of Crew Dragon Resilience on their way home. The crew wears those for dynamic phases of the operation like launch, docking, undocking, um, and return to Earth. And so uh, those can protect the astronauts in case of a fire. They also provide communications and cooling uh, to the suits, as well as they can protect the astronauts in the event of a depressurization. But they are different than the suits that we would use on a spacewalk and that some of those crew members did use on a spacewalk. Those are the bulkier, the bigger white suits uh, that you're used to seeing. Those are extravehicular mobility units or EMUs. And those are specifically designed for long durations outside of the International Space Station. They serve essentially as their own little spacecraft. And so those cannot be used interchangeably, uh, but both have very vital purposes. Yeah, the um, spacesuits that you saw the astronauts getting out of and I guess getting into, uh, they're all custom made for each of the astronauts and, and designed uh, and created in-house here at SpaceX. Uh, they are a one-piece suit. Everything is integrated from the gloves, the boots, and the helmet. Uh, so the astronauts basically uh, go into it and start zipping uh, everything up. Uh, and then there is an umbilical that is on the right uh, leg that will connect the suit with communications, electronics, and also um, send gases and nitrox to um, the suit uh, to make it a habitable, uh, habitable and comfortable environment for the astronauts. Uh, again, as Leah mentioned, if there is a depressurization event, the suit um, has a you know, sort of flame retardant, is flame retardant and can also uh, serve as you know their um, supply of, of air. Brian asks if the crew is having anything to eat before they return or do they eat afterward? Uh, they have just had their only scheduled meal on Crew Dragon. They do have multiple meals there and they have some snacks as well. And later on tonight, we may hear them call up or call down to the crew uh, here in Hawthorne exactly what they maybe uh, Eight or, or where they got it from in the capsule. Everything is very carefully tracked. And once they return, I am sure that they have already let their friends and family know what they would like to eat first, uh, having been stuck on the space station uh, menu for, for the past six months. So yeah. we've got a lot of good stuff up there, but some things are a little harder to get, like maybe a fresh salad or uh, fruit comes up every now and then. But Although I did see they, they do grow quite a bit of their own plants and vegetables up there. Um, uh, when the Crew 2 astronauts were going up and they were taking inventory, uh, I remember most of the snacks were depleted. So I'm very curious what <laughs> snacks they brought on board because it seems like everyone's going to those first. Um, 
but yeah, they have plenty of food um, in case they need to be in orbit for longer than you know what is planned today. Um, so the astronauts are cozy up there with plenty of resources. We are coming up on Depart Burn 3. Uh, despite the name, it is the fourth of these Depart Burns today and the final of these Depart Burns. Looking at that at 7.14 p.m. Pacific time, this will be the longest Depart Burn we've seen so far. Should last 61 seconds. And again, this is using a combination of different thrusters on board Dragon. It's got those service section as well as forward uh, bulkhead thrusters. And it just continues to take Dragon and put it in the trajectory necessary to uh, splash down later tonight or early tomorrow morning if you're on the East Coast, uh, just off the coast of Panama City, Florida. So the crew members are not in their seats for this. They they may not even know that the burn has happened, yeah. uh, that they may hear a call from the crew or from the core, I should say, the crew operations and resource engineer to let them know what's going on. And it's just been um, over an hour and a half since we've uh, undocked from the International Space Station. And it sure does feel like a lot of events have happened. Um, you know, the, the primary uh, sort of function for the Dragon was to make sure that it was clear of the uh, International Space Station and wouldn't put itself into a cross orbit. Um, but, you know, now we're finishing the fourth burn uh, in about uh, an hour here. The astronauts will put their suits back on and do some leak checks and then start to prepare for deorbit and uh, eventual rendezvous and return back to Earth. And Depart Burn 3 is underway. And we are waiting for confirmation of a successful burn, the fourth and final depart burn this evening. Dragon SpaceX burn complete, nominal burn. Okay, and uh, resilience copies, nominal burn, and that went a little bit longer than expected. That was uh, that was what you guys were expecting, huh? Checking. Yep, that was just as we expected. Okay, copy on. As we mentioned, that fourth to part burn, to part burn three, as it as known as it is known, uh, having been completed, and the crew confirming that it lasted a little bit longer than was initially planned, and that is Crew Dragon knowing exactly how long the burn needs to be to put us in the proper position for our deorbit burn coming later tonight. But everything has continued on schedule yep. uh, flawlessly for Crew Dragon so far today. That burn specifically circularizes Dragon's orbit, putting it in a roughly co-elliptic orbit with the station approximately 10 kilometers lower in, alt in alt altitude. So it should be the same uh, the same orbit as the space station all the way around the Earth rather than at perigee or apogee, a specific distance. And the next major event is suit donning that's coming up in about an hour and 15 minutes at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. And we will be live with you all the way from uh, earlier, from undocking all the way through splashdown and recovery. So please stick around. Keep sending in those questions with the hashtag Launch America. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. Manual control of cabin temperature is about to be disallowed. Okay, Dragon copies.